Hello, good evening to everyone who regularly joins me for some of my tough questions of the day around the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm following on from a video that I had done some time ago with regards to the patent that was found on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the cause of COVID-19. And I'm coming to this question because what I'm going to highlight in this very quick discussion is the importance of asking ourselves some really critical ethical questions. The first thing I'll do is I'll encourage you, if you have not as yet joined me on Substack, please do. There's a link below for the video, which you can watch for free on my Substack. But I'd encourage you to join me there. And you'll also see a link for a free ebook that I had created previously and one that I think that is still quite valuable for you today. Most importantly, you'll join me on my mailing list. So let's get into this ethical question. If SARS-CoV-2 was made in a lab, which groups were being targeted? Now, I'm speaking a little bit more openly about this because we've had this even on Weon um, news. COVID-19 leaked from a Chinese lab. This was published a few days ago um, on YouTube. And they were talking about the fact that uh, Anthony Hoff, I think, who was a senior um, past, I think the vice president of EcoHealth Alliance has stated that this is the case. He expects that this is the case. So it still remains theoretical, but more and more it's becoming clear that it is likely that the virus was made in a lab. But that's not really the big question to me. That's only part of the question. And it comes out from the fact that there was a patent found on this virus and we credit the scientists who were doing the research about this. And that's what I want to encourage you to watch on the video in the link. It really is a fascinating piece of science to see how it was discovered and the relevance that it has in terms of their theories as to why it could have been there. Which company has the patent? We didn't discuss that. We just discussed the science around it. So let's ask ourselves an important question. If the virus was made in a lab, who was the target? Now, the reason I ask that question is quite simple. When you step back from this, whether or not this was an accidental leak, a deliberate leak, the virus had on it a furin cleavage site. And this furin cleavage site made the virus more infective. It means it made it more likely for it to enter cells that had ACE2 as the entry receptor. That was designed. The question is, is why would you want the virus to be able to do that, specifically with the ACE2? Now, some of the research around cancer is being useful because you would want a virus, if it was carrying a, a cancer therapeutic, to more effectively enter a cell, and that could be a possibility. But the relevance of the connection with ACE2 is really, really significant. So here is where I'm going to share with you some of the science around my research. And if you haven't come across this, yes, this is what I've been saying since early 2020. Serum ACE2 is key to understanding autoimmunity in COVID-19. So that's been my research. We've public two, published two papers on it. We're working on some more. And what we had found what I'd found quite early in the pandemic was an unusual pattern where patients in China ha with hypertension were significantly at risk and children weren't. And so I was looking for a reason scientifically as to why that would be. And what I stumbled into was this serum ACE2. And what serum ACE2 is, is just effectively if you can imagine the entry receptor being uh, being ACE, ACE2, sorry, it's attached onto the cell here. The virus would bind to it and go inside. But for some people, instead of most of the ACE2 being attached to the cell, some of it is free floating. That's what we call serum ACE2. 
And it's not clear as to exactly what the physiology is behind it, but this is something that the body has been doing in certain comorbidities. And this was what we were saying with our research as to why we thought that certain comorbidities were more at risk for severe disease. And that's as simple as it was. If you have the enteroreceptor for the virus and you have a virus that binds tightly to it, it's likely that free ACE2 will interact with the viral spike protein in some way and it should either make the disease better or worse. But it's unlikely that it would have no impact. And in our research, we thought that it's likely that it made patients worse, severe disease. And so this became a huge, important question for us scientifically, but it now becomes an important question if it was man-made. Why, therefore, would it be so efficient at targeting specific groups who would have elevated levels of serum ACE2 and not others, young, healthy patients. That's effectively what it appears that is happening. And who would therefore be a target? So when you actually look at uh, serum or plasma ACE2, the critical determinants of an elevated level are age or sex, males more than females, okay, ancestry, East Asians and Africans, weight, that's obesity, then diabetes, age, and hypertension. Those are the determinants of the ACE2 concentration being elevated in the blood. And just to put it into context, free ACE2 is going to become an absolutely essential part of a cardiometabolic profile because when they did this study, and I'll make this full screen again, they did this study here in 2020. And what they found was that it was the best predictor of cardiometabolic mortality, higher predictor than if you smoke, if you have diabetes, if you're overweight, high blood pressure, or a high cholesterol. If your serum ACE2 is elevated, that is the best predictor. That's one thing that is good to come out of the pandemic is the fact that I think that one of the strategies we will use in the future will be to use serum ACE2 as a measure to determine the risk for individual people. So in 2021, October, I did this post. If gain-of-function research is true, some people are deemed to be expendable. That was a tough statement. And that was the time we were looking at gain-of-function research, looking at the furin cleavage side, because it was so targeted to specific cohorts of patients that it really made you think, why? Why would it be such a targeted focus in order for this virus to be so efficient? And we really, as a society, have to ask about how do we perceive our elders and those who have health conditions? Is that part of the reason why overweight people are more likely to be abused? Because we actually don't think that they deserve the same treatment as everyone else? Is that why we don't respect our elders? Because we view them as being not a major contributor to society. It really does reflect us as a society that we have this situation with COVID-19 that is so targeted. Remember, when they looked at the numbers coming out of the US, 97.4% of deaths, when they did that study, 550,000 hospital admissions, of which 27,000 died, 97.4% of them had at least one comorbidity. And that indicates that the virus very specifically targets those with specific comorbidities? A really hard question for us to reflect on. And I would encourage everyone to actually take a look at this video about the patent that was found in the spike protein on the virus. 
Could that have been an accident? Possible. It depends on what was probably being done in the lab, but without a shadow of a doubt, more and more it's becoming clear that this is most likely a virus that was man-made. We had, as yet have not found an animal vector that would be able to reasonably explain how it managed to get there. But this is the education. Just remember, serum ACE2. It's probably going to be one of the most important pieces of the future with regards to health. Who is at risk? As I said, older people, diabetes, age, males, and obesity seems to parallel quite easily the people who have died in terms of COVID-19. 60% of deaths are males, 40% are females. We don't see this normally in a viral infection. So in order for you to be ahead of what is happening, in order for you to understand fully what's going on, you not only need to listen on YouTube, you need to subscribe. Either get that free foundation ebook because it would also, also connect you onto my Substack. And my Substack has in it all of the hard questions that sometimes I can't necessarily talk about directly. So here we have me talking about vaccine, vaccine-induced myocarditis in a 38-year-old female. These are big questions, tough questions that nobody wants to address at the moment. But for those who are interested in science, science is not afraid to ask questions. We investigate, we probe, we look, and we don't stop until we have a full understanding of what is going on. So thank you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you on Substack or getting the ebook, and I'll be in contact otherwise. And uh, please have a great evening. Thank you.